But uh, 1 John chapter uh, 1, we're going to look at today. As uh, Ryan mentioned already, we're doing a, a series called No More. Uh, and it's, it's just a series uh, uh, on a study of 1 John and how 1 John can teach us how to find surrender in Christ and push back darkness and push back lies. And obviously, uh, even in light of what I just shared, that's really something that we have to work on in the church. We always have to make sure the church uh, is full of life and that we battle the darkness that can sometimes uh, creep in. Um, and so... Um, so I hope you're excited to jump into 1 John and, and learn how surrender is such a powerful thing, you know, in our lives. As Ryan mentioned, there's a reading plan that's on the flyer that we, we've been handing out. is in the foyer there. We're going to email that PDF out as well. So we really hope you will get deep into your Bibles, not just in 1 John, but just in, the, in just a lot of these themes that will come out uh, as we study out the book. Um, uh, you know, these are some great things, as you can see on the screen, you know, some of the, some of the things that, you know, we all struggle with, you know, pushing back darkness, lies, sin. Fear and doubt uh, in the churchwide fast and, and group prayer time, uh, you know, uh, the, the week that follows will be a great opportunity to put into practice some of the stuff uh, that we're even going to learn uh, through our study. So turn to First John, uh, if you haven't already, or, or touch and scroll to First John um, on, on your electronic device there. Uh, and let's just read the first chapter together, and then we'll get a little bit of background uh, on this great book. First John chapter 1, let's read together. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Verse 2, the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Verse 5 goes on to say, This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But, verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. He goes on in verse 8, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So let's look at this idea, uh, you know, uh, of no darkness, no more darkness. But I want to give you a little background on the book of 1 John before we uh, start this study here uh, for the next five weeks. Um, as the, the title of the book probably already implies, most scholars believe John the Apostle was the author uh, of these three epistles toward the back of the New uh, Testament. Of course, he also wrote Revelation, and he also wrote the Gospel of John, right? And so so he's, he's a pretty familiar writer in the New Testament, and... Um, you know, one of his, his uh, disciples, guys, one of the guys he mentored that went on to influence the early church more in the late 1st century, early 2nd century, was a guy named Polycarp. And he, in some of his writings, attributed 1 John to be written by the Apostle John. And what we just read also kind of signifies it, because 1 John 1, verse 3, he says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. And so, in other words, I, this is an apostle speaking to you, you know, about, the, uh, about you know, Christ and his resurrection. And so... The language and the themes also in John's gospel are very similar to what you'll find in 1 John. So we're pretty confident that John is the author. Uh, who did he write to? Well, he wrote probably to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, John moved eventually to lead in the church in Ephesus and then was severely persecuted as an older man toward the end of the first century and was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote uh, the book of Revelation. We know that from the actual text itself. In Revelation 2-3, through three, he addresses the seven churches of Asia Minor with some cool names, La Laodicea and Philadelphia, you know, and you can uh, look at that in another time. And Ephesus, of course, um, is one of those churches um, as well. And so we probably think 1 John was written around 90 A.D. based on, uh, you know, everything that we can kind of pinpoint to who he was writing to because uh, he wrote to them as well in Revelation 2-3. through three. Uh, why, is, why, why does it matter? Well, these themes in the book of John are really incredible themes. To, to talk about Christ versus the Antichrist, that'll be a theme that we'll look at uh, in, in this book. Light versus darkness, we'll touch on that today. Truth versus falsehood. Righteousness versus sin. The love of God versus the world. 
and then faith versus fear. These are, you know, these are real issues and real challenges. Um, and it's interesting when you start to kind of go through John's book, John was known as the apostle of what? The apostle of love, right? Uh, and so John will hit these really heavy topics, you know, like, you know, like truth and falsehood, but he always envelops it and wraps it in love, which is a really important thing when you're wrestling with real issues, whether they're doctrine or in life, that we, that we do it in love, amen? And so we're going to see that theme also throughout uh, this book. Um, it's likely one of the main issues this book addresses uh, was the early introduction of, a, of a, what would eventually become a false doctrine called Gnosticism. Gnosticism from the Greek word gnosis, which basically means knowledge. Uh, Gnosticism was a heresy that developed late 1st century, early 2nd century, uh, that really uh, had one of the fundamental flaws in it was, was it was very Greek in its thinking, um, and it believed that all flesh was evil. So they started teaching people, even in the church, who had been influenced by this thinking, that Jesus Christ, if he was truly God, couldn't have been in the flesh. And so therefore they were teaching false doctrine, because that's a very clear doctrine that we're going to talk about here in a moment, that Jesus was indeed God, but he came in the flesh. We just celebrated that at Christmas, right? And so that was a big deal. And with that kind of false teaching, supposed Christians would become immoral because they'd have no shame because your flesh doesn't matter. And so falsehood and sin would start to creep in often through this teaching. It also uh, created divisions over, over people who thought they were more enlightened because it also often fed this kind of keen spiritual insight that no one else had. And it also created a lot of division uh, in the church. Uh, and certainly it, it also put into question then Jesus' bodily resurrection because the New Testament teaches that Jesus, re- you know, he resurrected bodily. And again, if they say that, you know, that couldn't have happened because the flesh is evil, then it really even goes against the tr- very truths of the gospel. And so you could imagine in a church, if you have someone teaching this who has influenced the, the chaos and the confusion that this kind of thing could create. And so mo- a lot of scholars think this is probably what John was trying to address. He, you know, he was trying to say, yes, there has been confusion and chaos, but look to Jesus' truths in and with love, and there will be no more confusion and chaos. And so these five Sundays, we'll look at this theme of no more darkness, lies, sin fear and doubt. And so today we'll look a little bit at this idea of no more darkness, no more darkness. And, uh, and, and as I studied 1 John chapter 1 for the last few weeks, I've been kind of digging into it. There's so much in there. Um, it's crazy. Um, there are two fundamental questions I think John asks of his readers from chapter 1 that I think he would still ask us today, uh, were he here deli- delivering this sermon instead of me, I wish he was, but it's not the case. Two of the questions I I want us to think about as we look at 1 John 1. The first is, what do you believe? What do you believe? And the the second is, where are you walking? What do you believe today? It's always a good question to ask at church, amen. And where are you walking? Where are you walking? Let's look at this first idea of uh, of what do you believe? What do you believe? You know, it's pretty clear as you open this letter that John is, is looking to assure Christians who seem to have some kind of doubt in their faith, some kind of doubt in their faith. And, that, and that's good news for us. Um, good news that, that, that actually, you know, it's possible to know Christ and yet sometimes have doubts in your faith. A- anybody here, you know, who has faith doubts sometimes? I, th- I think if we're honest, we all do. We all do sometimes. And, and John seems to be addressing some of these doubts. Uh, you know, I love the story of Thomas. We don't have time to read the whole thing, but in John 20, 24 to 29, uh, Jesus is resurrected, the disciples are hiding, he appears uh, in a room, and, and, and Thomas is not there, one of the twelve. That was a bad, bad meeting to miss, amen, Thomas? And, uh, and so Thomas hears about it, and he says, man, I, I don't believe it. I, I'll only believe it if I can touch his, his wounds and, and put my hands on him. And then sure enough, next time they all get together, Jesus shows up in John 20, uh, verses 24 to 29. And he says, put your finger here to Thomas, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And and I love this passage because it shows us that Jesus meets us and helps us and even loves us in the midst of even our doubts about him. What what an amazing Savior, right? What what an amazing Lord uh, that we have. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all have a little Thomas in us at times. I, I once read... Doubt is a good shovel for which to dig for faith. And if you've been a Christian for a little while, you know exactly what I'm saying. You you start to wrestle with this and wrestle with that, but then you dig into that. You dig through that doubt, and you actually find greater faith oftentimes on the other end. If you're not a Christian today, you know, I hope today will help you to wrestle with your doubts and find true faith in Jesus. Uh, You know, it can be done. It's okay if you have doubts. 
And so, you know, how is your belief today? Here John makes it clear in his epistle uh, what we should believe about Jesus and how this can strengthen our faith. And the first thing here is that Jesus is divine. He makes it very clear that Jesus is divine. And we might say, or Jesus is God, right? That's another way to say that. In in the first uh, three verses, it's incredible. He says, the Son, Jesus Christ, he identifies him as in verse 3. He says, was in verse 1 from the very beginning, and I've kind of highlighted these points here, and was with the Father. So, you know, he was there from the very beginning. Sounds like Genesis chapter 1. So it makes sense then he was with the Father, right, the the Creator, um, the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this of himself, actually. These words came out of his own mouth in John's Gospel. John's Gospel, you know, some of the stuff that got Jesus killed by the Jewish leaders of his day was was the stuff like this that he said about himself. In John chapter 8, verse 58, uh, they're talking about Abraham, and Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am which is a phrase that God used about himself, I am. Uh, And this is, you know, about a thousand years after Abraham walked the earth. The Jews don't know how to handle that, right? They start freaking out. John 10, 30, he says again, I and the Father are one. Not familiar. He says, we we, we are one. And John 14, verse 9, to Philip, he says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so John makes it clear in his epistle here in the first three verses, and certainly in his gospel, that Jesus is divine. But of course Jesus is also human. This is what we call the incarnation that that you know that God, you know, in his divine nature became a human in the form of Jesus. And and John also makes this clear in his epistle here. He personally affirms uh, his belief in Jesus' humanity here uh, twice uh, and I have these highlighted in the text again. Twice he says we heard with our ears this Jesus. Four times he says we've seen him with our eyes. And once he says, we, we, we touched him also with our hands. And, of course, Thomas got a little extra bit of that, you know, in the gospel we just read. And again in John's gospel, John 1, 14, the word became flesh, he says, right, and made his dwelling among us. In John's gospel, uh, he emphasizes that Jesus eats, Jesus weeps, Jesus thirsts, and you could go on and on indicating his, his humanity. And then even in the resurrection accounts, it's quite interesting and subtle You know, Mary uh, sees the resurrected Christ outside the tomb, and Jesus tells her in John 20, verse 17, do not hold on to me, I've got to go. So she's hanging on to his resurrected body there. Uh, And and as we just read in John 20, he shows the disciples his crucifixion scars, and he allows Thomas to touch those very scars in John 20, verse 27. Uh, And then John 21, he eats with his disciples on the lake shore, Peter and the boys there after they'd gone out fishing. Uh, And so I... Why am I saying all this? If you're a Christian, this is not a new teaching. Obviously, you already know that we believe Jesus is divine and and Jesus is human. Thanks for us. That's great insight. But I think we often miss the incredible, profound implications and inspiration of this idea that Jesus is both human and divine. What do I mean by that? Well, John Piper, I think, uh, spoke of this well. He said, this is the stumbling block of the incarnation, that God is both divine and human. When God becomes a man, He strips away every pretense of man to be God. We can no longer do our own thing. We must do what this one Jewish man wants us to do. We can no longer pose as self-sufficient because this one Jewish man says we are all sick with sin and must come to him for healing. We can no longer depend on our own wisdom to find life because this one Jewish man who lived for 30 obscure years in a little country in the Middle East says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When God becomes a man, man ceases to be the measure of all things, and this man becomes the measure of all things. This is simply intolerable to the rebellious heart of men and women. The incarnation is a violation of the Bill of Human Rights written by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It is totalitarian, it is authoritarian, imperialism, despotism, usurpation, absolutism. Who does he think he is, he concludes, God, you know, the incarnation, you know, it challenges us, it reminds us, it enlightens us that with Jesus, it's all true or you better reject it, right? It's got to be, it's got to be one or the other. You know, with Jesus, we see in the incarnation, you know, there can't be any gray. It's either all light or all dark with this idea that he's both human and divine. And even though we no longer have him here in person, we live and we act as his disciples as though he is here in person. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You know, you know, for example, in contrast, 
You know, who here, who here knows who Abraham Lincoln is? I'm sure all Americans in the room know, you know, know who Abraham Lincoln is. And, and maybe you're inspired by him. Maybe you've read about him. But do you, do you try to know him personally? Do you, do you try to, you know, do you get up and put on a, you know, a big black top hat and try to be like him for the day? You know, we, we might think something's a little wrong with you, right, if you start doing that a little too seriously. I mean, maybe some people get paid to do that. But you understand what I'm saying, right? You understand. I know there are Lincoln impersonators out there. But with Jesus, that's exactly what we do. We, we literally live as though he's right there with us, and we know him, and we have a relationship with him, but he lived 2,000-plus years ago. That's an incredible thing to think about. And so all I'm saying is Jesus calls us to make a decision. And I put this up not to, not to you know, belittle him in any way, but these are the only four options you can really conclude with this idea that, that, that Jesus is both human and divine. The first option you know, there on, on, on the left is that, is that he's just a legend. He actually didn't walk the earth. He didn't actually exist. And people just made up the story because it's a feel-good story. And, and the rest is history. But the problem with that is legends take hundreds of years later to develop when no one is around as an eyewitness. And the, the first proclamation of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As far as dating the New Testament, that was written in around 50 A.D. So we're talking within two decades, the apostles are loudly and clearly telling people Jesus has died and resurrected from the grave. That's not how a legend is born. Because there would be eyewitnesses who, who, who could say otherwise, right? And 1 Corinthians 15 goes on to say there's over 500 eyewitnesses of this resurrected Christ. The other thing about the legend is Jesus is found not just in Christian writings from the time. He's found in Jewish writings from the time. Josephus, a very uh, 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 significant Jewish historian, writes about him. And he's also in Roman writings from the time because he actually lived and he actually had an impact in that time. So the legend option doesn't make a lot of sense. He could be a lunatic. He certainly could be a man who says the things we just... We just read about himself, if they're not true, is a little bit out of his mind. Let's just be honest about that. If I came up to you today and said, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, verse 6, you'd be a little bit worried about my mental health, wouldn't you? But that's exactly the kinds of things Jesus proclaimed himself, and exactly the kind of things his, his apostles taught and give us in the New Testament. We read about it here in 1 John chapter 1. It doesn't make sense that a lunatic could give us such a profound teaching, such a profound life, such a profound ministry. So the lunatic idea doesn't fly very far when you just look at the facts and the impact. Who's impacted the world more than Jesus? I don't think there's a close second. The other option, uh, you know, uh, of the false options, I believe here, is liar. Maybe he knew. You know, it was, it was the greatest, you know, spiritual heist in the history of the world. He knew he was deceiving the multitudes. He knew he wasn't really God in the flesh. And he just, he just you know, poor, he was the great spiritual Houdini, and he fooled everybody. And he actually wasn't ever from God, and he actually didn't resurrect, you know, from the grave. And, and this is where I trust the Apostle John and others who were there who I witnessed what he did. Because you might die for something you thought was true, but would you die for a lie? And, and, and John is the only apostle who wasn't martyred for his faith. He's the only one who died of natural causes. But 11 of the 12, or 10 of the 12, sorry, one took his own life. 10 of the 12, they were killed preaching the truths of Jesus. And so the idea of Jesus being a liar, it doesn't, it doesn't again, really pan out very much. And so the only other option is the best one, right, that Jesus is indeed Lord, that he is who he says he is, and that we can believe in him, and through him we can find eternal life. So what do you believe and why? That's my question for you today. If we believe he is Lord, then, then how we live truly matters. And that's what John's talking about here, right, in chapter 1, when he talks about walking in the light. And because John's uh, epistle, you know, contrasts this, he also calls out false belief and false teachers, right? Uh, in verse 6, I don't, I don't know if you, uh, if you caught on to it. Oh, sorry, I don't have a slide for that. But in verse 6, what does he say? He says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. So the good news is it's possible to know Christ and, and yet doubt at times, but the bad news here in verse 6 is it's possible to profess, profess Christ but be deceived. And that's what he's calling out here you know, in this letter, that there are men who are claiming that they really know who Christ is and, and what that means, but they're actually false teachers, and they're teaching false doctrine, and we think it was probably early forms of Gnosticism. You know, as I said. 
And, and the most obvious way to know if you're actually really walking in the light and you really aren't deceived is, is how you live. Do you live the way Jesus lived? And John will go on to really hit that hard uh, in chapter 2. And so Christians, you know, do you realize and know the good news of your belief? You know, look at, look at some of the stuff that, that John says comes from that. You get to encounter the word of life. You can find life through him. Verse 2 says you can find eternal life. Eternal life is an interesting phrase. We often think of it, you know, as quantity. You know, it lasts forever, and, and that is certainly true. But the other side of eternal life is quality. Quality. Uh, you know, God has given us the greatest quality of life forever. That's an incredible thing. That's an incredible thing to think about, you know. I don't, think, I don't think we can even fathom that, how amazing that actually is, if you understand what I'm saying. We also get fellowship. Verse 3, it talks about having fellowship with one another. Hey, man, isn't it good to be together today? Thank you for coming. We get that, you know, that, that horizontal fellowship, but we also get the vertical fellowship. Like I said, we're, we, we, we get to know Jesus. We get to know God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And, and he concludes in verse 4, what, what all that does is it brings complete joy. We can have complete joy. So why are we down on the way up, church? We should be so excited about what we have through our faith and our belief in Jesus. You know, let's wake up and see the joy of believing in Jesus, amen. And if you're not a Christian, what is your belief? If you're not a Christian, what is your belief in regards to Jesus? You can't say you don't have one. You have to have one. There's only four options from what we can see based on the history. As I said, he's, he's, he's either a legend, he's either a lunatic, he's either a liar, or he's Lord. Which one do you believe he is? And if we can help you encounter him through his word, that's how you'll really encounter him. We'd love to do that to help you find true and lasting belief in him. So to have no more darkness, we must have a true uplifting belief in Jesus. And also to have no more darkness, we must watch how and where we walk. Where are you walking is the other question to answer today. You know, the text here uh, in, in 1 John 1, verse 5, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's up there. This is like one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. What a statement. What a statement that John brings here in verse 5. You know, God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. You know, physically, darkness is it is not matter. It's not a thing. It's not a substance. Light is actually the substance. And darkness is just the absence of light uh, in the physical world. And so what I think or you think about God, honestly, it doesn't really matter in one sense. I mean, I know we're talking about your belief, but, but you can believe God is this and you can believe God is that. But what God has revealed about himself, that's what matters most. And what God reveals here about himself is that he is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. So, so if, you, if, you, if you feel like God is a little bit distant from you and, and holding out on you, well, guess who moved? It wasn't him. It was us. If you feel like, well, God this and God that, well, well guess in the end who's going to be found wrong on that. It's, it's, it's me, not him. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. And when you see him in the flesh... As you encounter Jesus in the scriptures, you can see that God is light. When you look at Jesus, there's no darkness when you open the Gospels. It's incredible when you see the life of Jesus to the point where the apostles, another claim they made about him was he was without sin. They were around that man for three years. They said he never sinned. You get around me for three minutes, you're not going to say that, right? You know, it's incredible. It's incredible. God is light. The other big theme in John's gospel is God is love. Or sorry, John's epistle, not gospel, sorry. Threw you off there. John, you know, 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. That's a beautiful, another beautiful picture, you know, that John gives us. In John's gospel, it talks about this, uh, you know, again, in John 1, 4, in him, referring to Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. John 8, 12, Jesus himself said, I am. The light of the world. There's another one of those divinity statements. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. What a promise, right? But will have the light of life. So if there's something dark in our faith, our life, our church, that's not on God. That's on us. That's on us. And that's so true that, that verse 6 says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, you know, yet walk in the darkness... We lie, 
and do not live out the truth. You know, it's like when you get in that, you know, fight with your spouse and they totally misunderstood you and they're totally deceived and you're like, no, 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 that's a lie. That's a lie. You know, I mean, for the defensive spouses out there, let's not be defensive. Let's let them get it out and let's work through that and find reconciliation. But, but you just instantly react sometimes. I know I do when my wife, you know, has seen something wrong that she thinks I did that was not accurate. And with God, it's like that. Oh, no, 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 no. If you, if you claim to be walking with this God who is light, but you're, but, you're, but you're actually full of darkness. You're lying, man. You're, 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 you're either deceived or you know you're lying or, or, or a little bit of both. And so there's this great contrast in the epistle here in the first chapter. You're either walking in darkness or you're walking in the light. And walking in darkness to define it, I think, is pretty clear. It's the opposite of 1-7. You know, what does 1-7 say? It says uh, there in the text, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all sin. So it's really a life being purified from sin. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Only the blood of Jesus can make us perfect, amen. But it's, it's, there's not a lifestyle of sin. You're not walking in darkness if you're really walking in the light. You, you will sin sometimes if you're a Christian, but you repent and you will not live in that sin. Uh, you know, Paul talks about this. I'm a little clicker fast here, sorry. Paul talks about this idea of, you know, um, sorry, no, I went, went too, too far. There, there it is. Uh, wow, I was really clicker fast there, sorry. Um, you know, Paul talks about this. He gives a whole list of sins in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Those, those things he says are obvious. You know, it, you know, it's not like, you know, it's like, that's, that's a sin? Really? Really, God? No, we know. We understand right and wrong. It's in, it's in, our, it's in, our, it's in our, our, our makeup. We're made in God's image. And Paul lists all these sins to the church. And he says, I warn you as I did before in verse 21 that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, in Ephesians 5, 8 through 11, I read it earlier in the statement we made about some lawsuits outside of here. You know, for you were once darkness, but now you are light of the Lord. So live as children of the light. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Again, there, there's no gray in this walk. You walk in the light or you walk in the dark. There is no in-between. There is no moonwalk here. You know what I'm saying? There, it's light or dark. It's light or dark. One or the other. And I think there's a human and religious tendency to say, you know, I'm not really that bad. We're not really that bad. I, we're, we're pretty good. We're, we've cleaned up most of our vices and try to get somewhere in that gray walk. But, but John won't let us do that in his epistle. It, it's all lighter. It's all, it, it's all darkness because God is light. So how do we walk in this light and stay away from the darkness? Well, actually, there's a lot of great practicals in this passage. I think there's three things here as we close out our time. Uh, the, the first way we can really walk in the light is here in 1 John 1, verse 7. Uh, you know, if we walk in the light, he, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I think the first thing here is to walk in the light, you got to understand the power of the blood. To walk in the light as a church, as an individual, you got to understand the power of the blood. And of course, we're referring to the blood of Jesus Christ himself, which we just celebrated, right, as we took communion together. Uh, you know, we got to understand, you know, in our fellowship, where the real power comes from. I mean, Ryan Jones is a great guy. I love him. He's a great guy. We dress alike today, you know, and... Uh, but the real power, you know, in our church here doesn't come from Ryan's leadership, right? It comes from the power of the blood. I love Terry Rose. Great guy. Appreciate his communion. Go Bills. Whatever. But, you know, but our power doesn't come from knowing Terry Rose. It comes from the power of the blood, right? And, I, and I, the church is amazing, but sometimes we forget where, where, what makes it amazing. It's the power of the blood. You know, and, and, and over and over the scriptures teach us that, right? In Ephesians 2, 13, we're brought near by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 13, 12, we're made holy through the blood of Christ. Uh, you know, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, we have confidence through the blood of Christ. In Revelation 1, 5, we have been freed by the blood of Christ. Is our fellowship being purified by the blood of Jesus? Do we, do, are we experiencing and encountering this nearness, this holiness, this confidence, this freedom? Legalism and its ugly relatives are really rooted in self-righteousness. It's all about my power and your power and our power, and that's what feeds 
legalism and self-righteousness. And we got, we, got to, we got to wash that with the power of the blood, amen? Because that's not the real power. The power is found in the blood of Jesus. A fellowship walking in the light remembers and knows the power of Jesus' blood. The second thing here is they also call sin, sin. A fellowship that walks in the light, they call sin, sin. I guarantee you, if you look up that message on YouTube, that doesn't have a lot of hits usually. It's not super popular, you know, to call sin, sin these days. But that's what John does. That's what he does here in 1 John 1, verse 8. 1 John 1, verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Again, in verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. You know, John calls sin, sin. The church should not be afraid to preach against sin and call it out. Because as we do this, we're protecting people. We're helping people. We're not hindering people. We're healing people. As we call out sin uh, in our lives, uh, you know, in, in our societies. And amen, I, I must say this, because we can, we can get off track here real fast. The greatest sin you and I should be calling out is our own. Look in the mirror. That's where you need to start always, amen? Always start there. You know, what did Jesus say in Matthew 7? You know, deal with the plank in your eye, then you can deal with the speck, you know, in some, someone else's eye. And, and that's why, as much as I hate to, to put out there today what I had to do in the beginning, talking about an article and, and, and some lawsuits with some of our sister churches, we as a PCC leadership, we, we're trying to call sin, sin. Sin is not going to be tolerated in the body of Christ. And if, and if it needs to get uncovered, we're going to uncover it. Because we're going to walk in the light, and we're going to call sin, sin. Even if that means the church or Christians even have to pay a legal price. A church walking in the light calls sin, sin. And lastly here, uh, a church walking in the light confesses sin. They also confess sin. Some of you are getting nervous right now if you're new. Don't worry, I'm not going to put on a collar and have everyone come down and confess their sin to me. We're not, we're not, that's a different, different church. Um, I will talk a little bit about that practice here in a moment. But what is John talking about? Well, I think it's two things. I think first, if you look at verse 8 and you look at verse 10, he's just saying, you got to acknowledge your sin. You know, I think of David in Psalm 51. He says to God, against you and only you have I sinned. So there's this acknowledgement to God, not that God doesn't know. <laughs> he already knows. But, but that we know that we sinned against God. That we know what sin is. And, and we, we own that. We recognize that. Um, so I think that's the first part, you know, of, of this idea of confessing sin that John talks about. But is that it? Is that it? Is it just between you and God? A lot of Christians like to stop there. But what's interesting is the New Testament doesn't just teach that as confession. The New Testament kind of, you know, uh, takes it to another level here, uh, you know, in these passages. Uh, you know, in James 5, 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Earlier in the text, what led to the therefore in verse 16 is the idea of, of, of the elders anointing the sick and praying over them so that they might be physically healed. So J James makes some kind of connection between our spiritual healing through our confession of sin to each other, you know, and, and this physical healing that he referred to earlier on uh, in the verses. Uh, the next scripture on there, uh, Matthew 5, 23 to 24, if you're at the, Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, sounds like you sinned against them, right? Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift in Matthew 5, 23 to 24. You know, it, most of our relational tension in this room, in your marriage, at your workplace, in your neighborhood, it involves sin. And it fractures and, and fragments relationships. Well, how do you reconcile that? One of the most powerful ways to reconcile that, and I'll give you some great marriage insight here for the marrieds, is you say, I sinned against you, and you confess your sin to your spouse. That's a very powerful thing. That's often the first step in, in fixing our, our broken marriages at times. It's not always the only thing we have to do, but it's part of the process. And so it's very obvious, just based on this passage, Jesus believed in that concept in one form or another. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Sometimes we need to seek a confession. When people don't see their sin, according to Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. And yeah, how you do that, how far you go, I think we need real discernment. We need to be very careful in confronting one another with our sin. But Jesus said that we should do just that. Sometimes we need to be helped to confess our sin and see our sin for what it is. And then Ephesians 4.25, Paul says there to the church in Ephesus, Each of you must put off falsehood 
and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. You know, Paul there is saying, you know, sometimes you, 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 gotta, you just got to get real with each other. Just be honest, you know. Hey, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? But you're not really doing fine. And sometimes in the fellowship, when we really get honest with each other in the appropriate way at the appropriate time, it can really bring truth into our relationships. Because all of a sudden, you discover someone who struggles with a sin just like you do, and you can help each other and pray for each other and spur each other on toward, toward repentance. And that's a, again, that's a beautiful thing. Walking in the light by confessing sin, both to God and each other, is a saving, gracious, healing, and merciful thing for God's people. Now, I understand it's completely debatable who you should confess to. I understand it's completely debatable when you should confess and what you should confess and how often you should confess. And I, I think historically our church has been too rigid with that practice. I think we've got to be very careful how we do that. You know, you need to pray. You need to think about the scriptures. You need to think about what the Spirit is leading you to do when it comes to, you know, confessing your sins to someone else. And then once someone confesses their sin to you or I, that's a whole other challenge. Because sometimes we, we, we bring ourselves into it. Now, if they sinned against you, then it is a little bit personal, and that's going to be a little more challenging. But, but, but for what I can tell from this scripture, and maybe, maybe I'm misinterpreting this, but in 1 John 1, verse 9, John says, If we confess our sins, he, referring to Jesus, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I don't think when someone comes to me humbly confessing their sin that I need to add anything else that God hasn't already done. I just need to pray for them and say Amen. But, but somehow we, we want to put ourselves into that and f fold our arms and share our disappointment. And who do we think we are? And I know a lot of that is done out of a good intent and a good heart. But we, brothers, sisters, we got to be careful. we got to be wise. But just because we mess up, just because we fall short, doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. I think the scriptures make it very clear it's part of a, of a church that really walks in the light. We confess our sins, and that's a good thing. I know for me, I'll never forget the first time I really did that. I was studying the Bible, and we were looking at Galatians 5, that scripture I, I referred to earlier. And this brother was like, you know, he started sharing about all this sin, and I was just like, I don't want all this information. Like, what is he doing? Like, you know, I was like, this is getting uncomfortable. And, and then he said, yeah, I just wanted to share all mine with you because I wanted you to share some of yours with me. And I was like, what would you just say? You know, I was, you know, I was 19 years old. I was like, what, what is this guy wanting from me? This is kind of weird. But, but so I said, okay. And I said, I think because he was so open, I just started getting him open. He got real, so I got a bit real. And man, I felt free. I, I, I felt different. And I, had, I didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. I definitely wasn't a Christian. And I could see the power of confessing my sin there. Because when you confess your sin, what you're saying is, I'm getting this darkness out of me. I want nothing to do with it. And so I'm going to put it out there and put it in the light of the fellowship, in the light of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And when we do that, that is a very healing and powerful thing, as John alludes to in 1 John 1, verse 9. What a powerful, healthy, beautiful, and healing church we can become as we walk more and more in the light. Amen? You know, a, a church fellowship that walks in the light of Christ, they know the power of Jesus' blood, they call sin, sin, and they confess their sin to God and each other. You know... Where are we walking these days? You know, where are we walking these days? What do you really believe? John challenges us in his first 10 verses here to really think about two very important and fundamental things. Let's choose to believe, amen? And let's walk in the light of the sun. There's no better place to be. Then there can and will be no more darkness. Thank you very much, amen.